Appreciate everybody coming tonight. I thank you for being in attendance in God's house tonight. And um, a lot of you have seen some of the material that I'm going to present tonight. Some of you, this is probably brand new. Anybody watching this video, maybe this is all brand new to you. But um, I thought it best that before we started with the scripture, I'd give my testimony a little bit about how God led me into believing what I believe, doing what I do with this ministry and so on. Uh, we're at Bethel Friel Baptist Church in Festus, Missouri. This is my home church. I've been here since about 1974. Some others here tonight have been here about that long. I was eight years old growing up in this church. All I heard was preachers behind, behind me here on this pulpit preaching out of a King James Bible. That's all I heard growing up as a free will Baptist, as a young Christian. Uh, that's what I heard. I didn't know that there was any problem with these new translations or any debate about that uh, as far as differences between the translations go. I remember that uh, God called me or I submitted to, my, to the call to preach uh, back in 1982. I was 16 years old right over here at this old mortars bench here in this church. And uh, God began to set a tone for my preaching and for the ministry that he's given me uh, even at that time. Because several years later, uh, I, I just sort of discovered through some research that, yeah, there was a difference between the King James Bible and some of the other translations that were out there, especially uh, a new Bible that had just kind of come along the scene, uh, the NIV. And uh, I, after I graduated high school, I went off to a Bible college, and it wasn't so much the professors that were uh, telling me that there were things wrong in the King James. Although in, I can remember in certain classes, I was trying to learn the Greek language and trying to learn things about the Bible. I can remember um, that uh, in some classes, certain professors would make comments about what they called uh, textual variants. In other words, they had a group of manuscripts here that didn't agree and so on, and they would see things in one translation that they didn't see in another. And I'm listening to that and I'm hearing that. And to me, it's all brand new. And so I'm just sort of believing and taking in what I'm being told uh, by my professors. But the biggest thing that, that came to me as far as my view on the translation was from the, from the student body. And I found myself wanting to get their acceptance and wanting to keep their acceptance. And I was in amongst a group of students that by and large could believe that they could use any translation. You could use any translation to preach or teach or anything like that. And right around that time, it was, uh, oh, we're talking about the, the mid-80s. There wasn't so much of it then as there is now, but the seeds were being planted and the seeds were sown in these young preachers' lives uh, in order to move away from the King James Bible out of their churches and move into these other translations. What we're seeing now in our churches is basically not just preachers who are saying, yes, I, I really love the King James, but I think this translation, ma translation makes better sense. What we're seeing now in our churches and from our pulpits and from our preachers and from our Bible colleges is not just a, a uh, let's do away with the King James, but an absolute hatred for the King James Bible. That is what we're dealing with right now. But I came out of that Bible college setting, and I remember going, and as I, when I pastored my first church back in 1990, I remember that by then I really had decided that there really was no better translation than the other. And in fact, uh, while I was there pastoring my first church, I was pastored there for three years, and we had a good ministry there. We saw some people saved. But a policy that the church had was, was to buy some Bibles uh, for people that got saved, especially little kids. And so I, I just kind of looked around a little bit and got an order for them, and I ordered an entire case of NIV Bibles to give out. Okay, now that was about 1991, 1992. And at that time, I mean, I would say that I didn't have any preference. Now, I preached out of the King James, but uh, I would go through the NIV, and I was using this saying that I had heard uh, other preachers say, and I just kind of believed it, that, well, kids probably will understand the NIV better. Boy, was I wrong, okay? But I just used that idea that kids would understand the NIV better. And so uh, as I progressed in the ministry and uh, when I came here, I think it was uh, 1994, something like that, I remember for the first time ever in a Sunday school class, in a young adult Sunday school class, 
I didn't use my King James Bible. I used the NIV to teach out of. And uh, I kind of made some people upset at that time. And uh, they didn't make a great big deal about it, but I knew that I made some people mad. But I still wasn't in this thing to where I was accepting the idea that uh, the King James was superior over any of them. In fact, I remember talking with preachers. And I would get in that circle of preachers and I would say, I used to be King James only, and, uh, but uh, you know we don't have any original manuscripts to compare with, so who knows which translation is the best. And uh, that was in the early 90s. 1997, uh, somewhere around 1997, 1998, the Holy Ghost of God came into, just sort of dealt with me privately. I remember this is right after that God had called me into a ministry of studying Bible prophecy. God uh, was kind of telling me that he was going to show me some things from the scriptures. And I, I had accepted that and was, was eager to study and eager to get into the word of God. But God still had not established for me or brought back to me that principle that the authorized version was the true and the pure Word of God. But I do remember one day sitting in my office and it's quiet and I'm just sort of meditating on the Lord. I'm thinking about things and God's trying to show me. And just sort of like that, the Holy Ghost came in in a very, very sweet, still presence and said, Mike, the King James Bible is the Word of God and it has no mistakes in it whatsoever. As soon as that happened, the white flag came out. I surrendered to what the Holy Ghost... I mean, who can argue with the Holy Ghost? Amen? You just can't do it. I surrendered to the Holy Ghost. I surrendered to what God was trying to teach me in my life. And as far as I was concerned, that was it. I had no evidence whatsoever. I had a blank page as far as why the King James was the Word of God other than this is what I know for a fact that God told me. Now, after sharing that testimony with you tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to supply the evidence that God has shown me over the past few years. And I have a ton of it, but I'm not going to share a ton of it tonight. I'm going to share about 500 pounds worth tonight of the evidence that God has given me of why we believe that the authorized version is the Word of God. You see the scripture there up on the screen, and I'm going to begin with that. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do you believe the Word of God? Say amen. amen. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? God has shown me over the years that God usually takes things, and if you can just go through the Scripture, and I don't have time to do it here, but if you'll just go through the Scripture, you will plainly see that God is in the separation of things that are opposite. I mean, look at these verses again. We have unbelievers on this side, and we have believers here. And God says, do not yoke yourself in together. As believers, do not yoke yourself in together with unbelievers. He said, stay away from them. Righteousness and unrighteousness. Light and darkness. Christ, and this is interesting, because it says, what concord hath Christ with Belial, and that word concord means a contract or an agreement. And the interesting thing about that is, is that we see in Matthew that the devil actually tried to get Jesus into an agreement with him. When Jesus was fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, do you remember that? The devil showed up and tried to get Jesus into a contract or a concord with him, and Jesus refused with the word of God. So God said, keep these things separate. Now, I'm setting a tone here tonight for how I'm going to present this thing to you tonight. So just bear with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. He continues on. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye what? separate, saith the Lord. Now I'm going to show you a symbol up here, and we just talked here in this church about symbols, and I, talk, I make use of symbols in a lot of the videos because they're out there, and they have meaning. Take a good look at this symbol. 
This is called the yin yang. It is a Chinese symbol, but it is a universal symbol. It's being accepted all over the world, and it basically it implies a universal doctrine as far as the doctrine of the devil is concerned. You notice that you have sort of a white area and a black area, and in the white area you have a, you have a black dot, and in the black area you have a white dot. This is the concept that uh, there is a little good in all evil or a little, little light in all darkness and that there is a little darkness in all light or a little evil in all good. So what we see here in this symbol, and I could show you tons of others tonight, but what we see here in this symbol is the idea that in the devil's religion, he doesn't keep things separate. He takes things that are opposite of each other and he fuses them together. Do you see that in that symbol? Okay. Now this is, here again, this is real, real important because we're going to see this doctrine, how it's crept in to the church of God. Now he says in Jeremiah 51, he says, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, he will render unto her a, cut, a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Now, here's what God's telling us, and this is going to lead into what the next slide is going to show you. Number one, the, the kingdom of Babylon the Great is not about separation. It's about joining things together. So in God's religion, God says, I want everything that's opposite, light and day, darkness and, and, uh, and light and good and evil, I want them to be separated. I want my people to be separate from the world. That kind of knocks down all this Rick Warren stuff, amen? All this stuff that's going on in the church where they say, we've got to bring the world into the church or the church has to be worldly in order to reach lost people. That's a fallacy, by the way. God never says that in the Word of God. That's man's idea. That's the devil's idea. God said, come out from them and be separate. And lost people will come to you. Is that what you believe? Say amen. Listen, lost people, someone who really, really wants to be saved, they don't want to get saved by joining something that's exactly like their life is right now. They're wanting something that's better than what they have, and by and large, most churches are not offering them that. They're offering them some of the same old stuff. So Babylon, basically her kingdom is built upon mingling things together. And I want you to notice there, up at that, that verse again, verse 7, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Now I want you, it took me a while to get this. It took me a while to understand this concept of what God meant when he said, basically he's saying here, Babylon is what I use in this world. Babylon is what I use in this world. And I'll explain it to you like this. There are two types of people in this world. There are people who want to know the truth, and there are people who don't want to know the truth. Which one are you? You want to know the truth? Amen? There are people who want to know the truth, people who don't want to know the truth. To those who want to know the truth, God gives them the truth. God teaches them the truth. God shows the truth. God turns the light on like he did with me. Amen? Those who don't want to know the truth, God uses what would be the opposite of this, and it would be the kingdom of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. He uses her to people who only want to be lied to. He uses her, and he uses this word where God says she has made the people of the earth drunken. Now, I'm not going to ask you tonight who in here has been drunk. I don't want to know, okay? I mean literally, physically drunk. But when you're drunk in your mind, do you know or not know? You don't know, amen? And God says, that's what I'm going to use in these last days. I'm going to use Babylon to do that. And I want us to look at how the Bible uses drunkenness and wine and strong drink in the Scriptures. Notice this verse here, Leviticus 10, 9 and 10. God said, do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. 
It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that you may put difference. Notice what he's saying here. That you may put difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean. Notice that God says, do not drink wine. Do not drink strong drink. Do not drink alcoholic beverages. Why? He said, because if you do, you might, know, you not, might not be able to tell the difference between clean and unclean, between holy and unholy. And he said, as a priest, if you go in and you're drunk and you don't know the difference, you will profane my temple. And God said, I can't have it. Somebody say amen. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever, notice the wording here. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 7 and 8. But they have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Notice how God is showing you that wine, not just physical wine, but spiritual wine, the wine that Babylon has, he's showing you that through bringing her in or allowing her to take over, allowing her to take control, you are going to err in judgment. You're going to be one of those people in spite, in spite of what the Bible says, you're going to be one of those people who say, when you have obvious sins in your life, you're going to be one of those people who say, I don't see anything wrong with what I'm doing. You ever heard people say that before? I don't, preacher, I, I don't see anything wrong with, with having a beer every day. Preacher, I don't see anything wrong with, with living with my girlfriend. Amen? God says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. And then he talks about in Isaiah 28, they, they err in judgment, they stumble in judgment, they don't know anything. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the Bible says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice, notice the contrast here. You can either be drunk with wine, or you can be filled with the Spirit. Which would you rather be? Drunk with wine? Filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, be, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Notice what Paul is warning us about in these last days. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve. Now here in a little bit, we're going to go back to the book of Genesis, and we're going to see how the serpent deceived Eve because the same process is going on in this country, it's going on in this world, and it's going on in churches every Sunday morning. The devil is deceiving. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, number one, another Jesus whom we have not preached, Number two, if you have received another spirit, which you have not received. Number three, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. The key point here is, notice what he says about another gospel. I'm going to show you in a little bit how this Bible, the King James Bible, shows you the real gospel. And what is the gospel? It's, some say it's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. But it's how can a man be saved? How can a man be born again? I know the people in this church. I know others. We stand on the principle that by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a what? It is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And what I'm going to show you later on tonight is I'm going to show you from these other Bibles that they actually say that you're saved by works and not by grace, or not by, not by grace through faith. I'm going to show you that. And so Paul said, he warns us, he warns us about a time when they would come bringing to us another gospel, and they're doing it right in the Bible translations. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. The Bible says, For such are false apostles, 
deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed. Look at that word transformed. Transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness who end, whose end shall be according to their works. What was it that Jesus warned us about would be coming in the last days? He warned us about wolves that were dressed how? In sheep's clothing. So he's telling us who are believers in the Bible, believers in Jesus Christ, that we should be consciously aware that when the devil begins to bring his deception in or when the devil is ready to, let's say, conquer a church or a denomination or a ministry or even a Christian, that he will use wolves that look like Christians. Wolves in sheep's clothing. I have a pastor friend. He came up. God gave him some deep deep wisdom one day and he shared that with me preaching a message one time he preached a message on wolves in sheep's clothing and he said I'm gonna give you some deep theology he said wolves in sheep's clothing are not sheep amen that's deep isn't it wolves in sheep's clothing are not sheep and I dare say that popular Christianity has been infiltrated by wolves in sheep's clothing. Would you agree with that? Say amen. amen. He told us to watch out for these guys. Now, that symbol that I showed you earlier uh, of the yin and the yang, basically what it was, you remember it had, the, uh, had the, the, the black field and the white field, and then it had the black dot and the white dot, and what it was basically was the idea that these things are fused together into, a, into like a new concept or a new idea. In political science, it's called the Hegelian dialect. And what you have is, you have maybe on one side, you have a principle which is called thesis. And pay attention to this now, it's going to be a test, okay? Then you have another principle that is its exact opposite on the other side called antithesis or antithesis. I'm using big words here, okay? And uh, generally, these two ideas are never supposed to get along, they're never supposed to agree ever. Let me kind of put it like this. Let's say that, uh, let's say that uh, Brother Joe here, he believes that um, God created the world 6,000 years ago in six days. Do you believe that? Say amen. Okay? Now I'm going to pick on Bradley here. Let's say that Bradley, he's a heathen, and uh, he's a beer drinker and a woman chaser, and he doesn't even believe in God. And I'm just picking on you. And um, he doesn't even believe in God. He believes what they taught him in public school. He believes that we came from monkeys 15 million years ago and that before that there was just this nothing out in space somewhere that just uh, all of a sudden happened. That's called evolution, right? And that over fit like 15 billion years we are what we are today, okay? Monkeys, all right? Now, this idea of evolution says there is no God and God didn't create anything. This idea over here is the exact opposite. It says that there is nothing that God didn't create, that everything that is, God spoke it into existence, and according to the Bible, it took place about 6,000 years ago, and God did it in six days instead of 15 billion years. So these two ideas, this is thesis, and this is antithesis. Now, they don't agree, do they? And there's really no way that they should. But somebody somehow figured out how to meld them together into a synthesis or a new synthetic doctrine. And it's called theistic evolution. It says, yes, and they sound real spiritual when they say it. They say, yes, bless God. We believe that God created everything. He created it 15 billion years ago, and over time, it's evolved into what we are now. But that's not what this book says. And so if you claim to be a Christian, and you have swallowed this new idea of theistic evolution, then what you have to do with the truth is relegate it to a myth. 
The Bible says that they are turning the truth of God into a lie. And if you believe theistic evolution, that is exactly what you have done. So this new synthetic idea, these new synthetic doctrines are everywhere. Let's say that, uh, let's say that uh, you have the, uh, the Bradley the heathen here doesn't believe in God, so therefore he doesn't believe in hell. Doesn't believe in a punishment of, of fire for the wicked. Brother Joe here, he believes what God said. He believed that Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven. He taught parables about hell. He's trying to warn everybody about hell. And by the way, the Bible says hell's on fire. Amen? Well, you can't fuse those two ideas together, but they have. Now there's a concept out there now that says hell is not on fire. It's a new synthetic doctrine of opposites that are fused together. We see it in areas of politics, public morality, commerce, and basically it's a way of getting us to accept things that we never would have accepted before. Commerce, advertising, television and film are loaded with these concepts and principles. Let's look at how it affects in the, in the idea of the Bible translations. Notice the screen up there. Basically, here's a quote. Here's a quote from a, uh, from a website teaching you how to read the Bible. It says, each translation has the power to transform your life. The voice of God can speak to you through each one of them. Notice this one here from a Southern Baptist Sunday School publication called Events. This is a Sunday School literature for teenagers. Notice the quote here. It says, always use more than one translation. Let the Lord speak to you through more than one voice. Doesn't that sound, that sounds dangerous already, doesn't it? All versions can help us to hear the voice of God. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like they're saying that God's voice is not explicitly contained in the Bible. That it's some esoteric voice that you will receive into you if you happen to read certain things in the Bible. By the way, that's borderline witchcraft. Amen? All versions can help us to hear the voice of God. The Bible is not what it appears to be. It has no single author representing a uniform and consistent point of view. This, now, let me, let me explain this now. Here's the idea where here's a, here's a born-again believer. Here's a man who's, who has lived a reckless, sinful, wicked, hell-deserving life all of his life, and he heard the preaching of God's Word, and he got saved, and he believed the Bible because it saved his soul. Here's a Harvard-educated liberal theologian that doesn't even believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And he says the Bible is just the words of man. It's fables. It's nothing. These two guys don't agree, do they? They're not going to go to the same Bible conferences, are they? But when you fuse these two ideas together, you now have a new synthetic doctrine that looks exactly like what we just read. That yes, the Bible is full of mistakes. Yes, no translation is perfect. But if you get all of them out there in front of you and spread them out there and begin to read each one of them, then when you do that, if you read different translations, then you would be able to hear the voice of God. What I'm going to show you tonight is that the voice that they're talking about is not the same voice that you and I know to be the true God. It's a different God. Let's look at what God said about His Word tonight. Psalm 119, 140, Thy Word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Psalm 119, 160, Thy Word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments does what? Endureth forever. Psalm 12, verse 6, The words of the Lord are what? Pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now what I'm going to show you, what I'm going to do up here on the screen here in a little bit, is I'm going to show you 
how the King James says one thing and how the other translations, and I ha I'm not even covering some of the newer translations that are out there like the Holman Standard or the Message or the, uh, any of these others that are just sort of new, but you can see the same thing there. What I'm going to show you is that this corruption of the Word of God that is taking place in these new Bibles comes in three ways. Number one, the changing of the reading. They're going to change what the verse says. Number two, omission of part of the verse, or number three, omission of all of a verse. You'll be so, in fact, I've got, a, I've got a new slide up here. I can't wait to show you. I'm going to show you just how weird this looks when you take an entire verse out of the Bible. Now, up, up there on the screen, there on the, uh, on the uh, left-hand side here, is the King James Bible. Notice what Hosea 11, 12 says. Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God. It says, Judah ruleth with God. Now let's look at the NIV. The NIV says, Judah is unruly against God. Now stop and think about that for a minute. Here, one Bible says that Judah ruleth with God. Here, another Bible, the NIV, the most popular translation right now, says Judah is unruly against God. Is that saying the same thing? No, you can't, it doesn't say the same thing. So remember, these are opposites, right? And opposites have to stay separated. Now the New Synthetic Doctrine says that if you read both of these verses, one from the King James, one from the NIV, that you should be able to hear the voice of God in these contradictions. That doesn't sound right, does it? But that's what is being taught in our Bible colleges. That's what's being taught in our Sunday school rooms. That's what's being taught in the big money ministries. That's what's being taught from our pulpits all across the country. Is that, oh yes, use more than one translation. You'll hear God's voice better if you'll do that. And yet when you see these contradictions, how can you hear God's voice? One of them has to be right, doesn't it? One of them has to be right. Take a look at this one. Genesis 22, left-hand side, King James. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. This is very, very important, the exact wording of this verse. Because what this story is talking about is talking about Abraham and Isaac. You remember that, right? And God, how God instructed Abraham, and Abraham took Isaac, and he took him up to Mount Moriah, which is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he laid him there on the altar, and the Bible says that he, that he, took the, took the, he tied him down, he took the knife, was ready to plunge it into his chest, and what happened? Did he do it? What stopped him? The Bible says an angel of the Lord appeared. That was Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord appeared and said, Abraham, stay thine hand from thy son. Don't do that to him. God had provided himself a sacrifice. Amen. God had provided that ram over there. And this is important because if you believe that God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, then when Abraham pulls that knife up into the air, he is ordered by God to plunge that knife into his chest, isn't he? And not even an angel is supposed to contradict the Word of God. And yet, if you look there on the right-hand side, the NIV tells Abraham to go ahead and sacrifice him there. The King James simply says, offer him up. The NIV says, sacrifice him there. Two different ideas, aren't they? Two different opposing ideas. And we see, the, we see the severity of it because the NIV is actually telling you that Abraham disobeyed God or, or that God changed his word. You see the significance of it? The NIV, or the, excuse me, the NIV, the King James got it right. Say amen. Make sure I say that right. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Who is that? That's Jesus. Amen. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, do you believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Mary had not known a man when she had Jesus? Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. Essential doctrine of the faith. You have to believe that, by the way. 
You have to believe that because that's what God said. Notice what the Revised Standard Version said. It says a young woman will conceive. What's the difference? Doesn't say she was a virgin, does it? Okay? And by the way, nothing remarkable here, is it? Is it, is it something unusual today that a young woman will conceive? And Now that's happening all over the place. Amen? Notice Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is the King James. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Notice this. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That teaches the doctrine of the eternality of Jesus Christ. Jesus always was, always is, and always shall be. Do you believe that? Say amen. Oh, no, 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 he wasn't created. Amen. He didn't just pop up on the scene one day. He always was, is, and shall be. That's what the King James said. The NIV says, whose origins are from old. It says that Jesus had a beginning. And see, that's interesting because if you believe that Jesus had a beginning, then you can also believe that he has an end. And I just happen to know a fallen angel who would love to see the Son of God come to an end. Can I hear you say amen? Matthew chapter 18 verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this. This is where we're going to get into the realm of a new gospel. Notice the words, be converted. When you were converted, who did it? Who changed you? God did. The Bible did. The Holy Spirit did. The blood did. Amen. That's what changed you. You couldn't change yourself. You tried, didn't you? Couldn't change yourself. Notice what the NIV says. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change, unless you change, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's putting salvation in your willpower and in your hands. That is a false gospel. John chapter 3, verse 16. Here we go. They mess. Let's say this together. How many of y'all know this? Without looking at the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, you've known that verse for a long time, haven't you? Did you know they messed with this one? In the in New English Version, they called him his only Son. But they dropped the begotten Son. Part. That's important. His only son, Revised Standard Version. NIV, his one and only son. The doctrine of the begotten son of God. And what am I saying there when I say begotten son of God? That means that he literally is from God the Father. And when you take that out, then Jesus can simply be the created one who became the Son of God. By the way, if you'll compare most of these verses that I'm showing you with the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New World Translation. See, the Jehovah's Witness could come to your door. If you use an NIV, Jehovah's Witness could come to your door, pull out your Bible, and prove your doctrines wrong with your NIV. That's scary. Amen? And I, I don't know if they know that or not, so I hope this video doesn't get to their hands. Unless it's going to change them. Amen? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. you believe that? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Notice how they've changed this verse. The New English Version says, Every inspired Scripture has its use. But they have removed the doctrine of the total idea that all the Scriptures inspire. 1 Timothy chapter 3, great, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's the doctrine of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you will go to the New World Translation, which the Jehovah's Witness use, you will find that they have messed this verse up to take out the fact that God was manifest in the flesh because they don't want you believing that. By the way, the NIV does the same thing. 
it says he appeared in a body. You know what that kind of tells me? It kind of gives you the idea that Jesus was a man that God came in and possessed him. That's not our doctrine. That's false doctrine, amen? That's false. One of these is lying, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. See, in Paul's day, they were already corrupting and changing the Bible. They were already doing it. Notice what the NIV says. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Oh, yeah, they do. In fact, that's why they're printing all these new Bibles. Did you know that, 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 that Zondervan publication that owns the copyright to the New International Version of the Bible, which is owned by News Corporation, or excuse me, which is, yeah, is owned by News Corporation, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch. You probably heard of him on the news. He just bought the Wall Street Journal. One of the richest, most powerful media publishing guys in the whole world. By the way, watch this. Talking about fusion of things together. Rupert Murdoch owns News Corporation, which owns two publishing companies. One is Zonderfin Books, which publishes the NIV. The other company that he owns is HarperCollins Publishing, which publishes the Satanic Bible. And he's getting rich off both of them. Stop and think about it for a minute. There's mingled fruit on the tree, amen? Something's not right here. But see, this same rendering is also found in the New King James Version of the Bible. That same idea. They've changed the Word of God. Mark chapter 10, verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. And I believe that, don't you? Notice what the NIV says. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Notice they took something out, didn't they? And they've changed the entire meaning of the verse. And they're trying to tell you. That, uh, listen, uh, they're trying to tell you that it's hard to get to heaven. And I want to tell you guys something. We don't need it any harder than sometimes it is. Amen? Yeah. And I know this life, is, if you're going to live this life the way the Bible says, it's hard. But I want to tell you something. I believe in grace bigger than me, don't you? And you know what? It might have been hard to get us to heaven, but God figured out a way. Amen? God figured out a way. This Bible is... And now remember, we're supposed to read these both two translations, and we're supposed to hear God's voice in here somewhere. I'm not buying it. Amen? I'm not buying it. Isaiah chapter 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Who's, who's Lucifer? Y'all believe that's the devil, don't you? Even the witches, the Satan worshipers, they believe that's the devil. They believe that Lucifer is the devil. Okay? You know who doesn't believe Lucifer is the devil? It's the Bible scholars now, and the theologians, and the professors, and now a lot of our preachers. And you know where they got that from? Because the NIV took his name out. How art thou fallen from heaven, O morning star? Do you know who the morning star is? The morning star, according to Revelation 22, 16, is Jesus. The NIV says that Jesus, the morning star, fell from heaven. That's blasphemy. Amen? That's blasphemy. And now remember... Are we starting to hear God's voice here? Mm. Notice I have up here, no wonder, big question marks. No wonder what? No wonder we have sodomites and queers standing behind pulpits in this country. Deuteronomy 23, 17, the King James says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor sodomite of the sons of Israel. That's what God said. The NIV says, no Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. They took it out. Notice the next one. And there were also sodomites in the land. And they were an abomination, right? Notice what the NIV says. There were even male shrine prostitutes. Took that out. Now that's interesting. Because in case you didn't know this, a woman by the name of Virginia Malincrot 
was on the translating, one of the translating committees that helped translate the NIV. Guess what she was? She was a sodomite. She was a lesbian. An open one. They put her on the translating committee, Steve, to translate the Bible so that you would understand. Mm -mm -mm. No wonder, no wonder, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Get back here. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. That's talking about John the Baptist. And the Bible says that he was full of the Holy Ghost. When? When he was inside of his mother's womb. So why is it now okay for us to abort a fetus? D does, does life start at birth or does it start at conception? The Bible says it starts in the womb, doesn't it? Yeah. And yet the NIV says he will be filled with the Spirit even from birth. Now remember, we're supposed to hear God's voice in here. Somewhere, we're supposed to hear God's voice. Matthew chapter 1 verse 25, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. The NIV, speaking of Joseph, and Jesus, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. The firstborn idea is taken out, taking away her virginity, taking away the idea of a firstborn son. Notice in Luke chapter 2, verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled at, notice that it called Joseph, Joseph. Who was Jesus' father? God. Was it Joseph? See, you were taught that in Sunday school, weren't you? That Jesus was the Son of God. If Jesus was the Son of Joseph, how could he be the Son of God? Couldn't be, could he? So the, so the King James says, Joseph and his mother. The NIV says, the child's father and mother. It calls Joseph the father of Jesus Christ. No wonder we're not having revival in our country. No wonder the whorehouses and the bars and the, everything else are not being shut down in this country. Amen? Luke chapter 4, verse 4, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The NIV says man did not live by bread alone. And they've taken out the entire rest of the verse. It's been omitted. Luke chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The NIV says, Jesus answered and said, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. Notice that the devil, who didn't like the fact that Jesus said, Get thee behind me. Notice the devil took those, took those verses out of the NIV, and all the other new translations, by the way. John chapter 6, verse 47, Verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Life. The NIV says, he who believes has ever life. Believes in what? Amen? Believes in what? Everybody says, you got to believe in something, right? It's like the bumper sticker I saw. that said, everybody's got to believe in something. I'll believe I'll have another beer. And that's what it said, right? And the idea is, what, what is it that you can believe? Can you just believe in anything and go to heaven? I'm being a little sarcastic there, ain't I? But I want to tell you something. It bothers me. When they say, oh, you just believe now, you just believe now, and everything's going to be okay. That's not the Bible, amen? 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And ev watch this, watch this. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come, how? In the flesh is not of God. Notice what it says here. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. The Bible, the King James Bible, is telling you how to identify the false Christ and tell the difference between him and the true Christ. Because he says that the spirit of Antichrist is going to be where they deny that Jesus is come in the flesh. Look at the NIV version of this same verse. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. What did they take out? They took out that Jesus is come in the flesh. They took that out. So does the spirit of Antichrist, is it in the NIV? Of course it is. Look at the next verse. This verse is completely gone. Howbeit this kind goeth not but out, out but by prayer and fasting. That same verse is also found in Mark chapter 9 verse 29. Matthew chapter 17 verse 21. The entire verse is gone. 
I pulled that up on my, on my quick burst there on my computer, and I looked at it, and I took a, took a, a picture of it. If you'll notice there up on the left-hand side is the King James. Notice that verse 21 is printed out. Notice the, over where the NIV is. Notice where verse 21 is. There's a blank there. You know, that ought to tell you something. Wait a minute. Who erased something out of my Bible? And notice the fact that it's prayer and the only real power that we have against strongholds of the devil is prayer and fasting. And they took that out of the Bible. Dun, dun, dun. See, I believe in conspiracy. I think something's wrong. Amen? For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. That verse is God out of the Bible, out of the new translations. Matthew 23, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. That verse is completely gone. How about this one? Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. What's that talking about? And remember that new synthetic doctrine? It says, hell's not on fire. Guess where they got it from? Mark chapter 11, verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That verse is completely gone out of all the new translations. Here's a doozy for you. These verses, completely gone out of the new translations. Well, let me, let me say this. That's Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. That deals with the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the book of Mark. It deals with the fact that uh, when God's power is on us, that uh, they'll speak with new tongues, they'll be able to cast out devils, and all that, stu all that stuff that God promised us He would keep us protected from is gone out of the Bible. Now, you might, if you look in the NIV, you might find it there, but here's what they do. They put a line across the page after verse 8, and they say, the most reliable and early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. By the way, they're lying through their teeth. They are in the earliest trans, uh, manuscripts that we have. I don't have all the manuscript evidence. I don't know all that stuff. But I'm telling you, they're lying through their teeth. What they're telling you is, you have our permission to not believe all of these verses should be in the Bible. That's what they're telling you when they do that stuff. This verse, gone. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, you know what that was talking about? That was that Ethiopian eunuch who, who said, he, he was reading Isaiah. He wanted to get saved. They drove up on water. The eunuch said, Here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You know what he was asking? He said, How is it that I can be baptized into the faith? And Philip said, You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They took that verse out of the Bible, which now teaches you that all you have to do is be baptized and you're okay. False doctrine. False gospel. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. That verse, completely gone out of all the new translations of the Bible. Those who translated the NIV, they wrote a book called The Making of a Translation to really sort of uh, pump up what they did and, the, and all that they did. And here is the accusation concerning these verses. Here is the accusation that they make against the King James. They say the KJV adds to and so alters the Word of God. They're saying that for 400 years, your parents and your grandparents and your forefathers who fought and died for this country did not have the Word of God. But thanks to these guys on the NIV committee who were not even Christian to begin with, now they've brought it to you. That sounds like a cult, doesn't it? Let's compare what the Bible says about itself with what the new translations. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. That means you can count on it. The NIV says that we have the word of the prophets made more certain. Difference there. Psalm 119, 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. The NIV says in that same verse, your promises have been thoroughly tested. In other words, yes, I give my approval to the Bible. That's a lot different than being very pure. It's like God needed your permission before he could publish it. Amen? Psalm 119, 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The NIV says all your words are true, and all your righteous laws are eternal. But notice that they've taken out from the beginning. 
That's why you can believe in evolution, they say, and still be saved. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The NIV says, O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. They have removed the doctrine of the preservation of the Scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. How many of you would like to be perfect? Say amen. You know what's going to get you there? This book. N and nothing else. Amen? Power of positive thinking. Uh, all these cults out there that tell you that you just have to have the right thoughts and everything will be okay in your life, that's not going to do the trick. They say the Word of God is what's going to make you perfect. Now let me ask you a question. If the Word of God is not perfect, how can it make you perfect? You see what I'm saying? And the NIV takes that verse and omits that the man of God may be perfect. They've taken that out of there. I smell a rat. Amen? I smell like there's something up here. Here's what the Bible says. Now, are we going to believe God or are we going to believe men? God's going to say one thing. Mankind's going to say another. I don't care what Bible college they went to. I don't care if they got Dr. So-and-so in front of their name, if they wear a robe or a tie or a T-shirt. I don't care who they are, where they come from, what their birth is, where they went to school, how many people they got in their church, how big their ministry is. I don't care anything about that. If they say something that's contradictory to the Word of God, they're wrong and God's right. So watch this. The Bible says thy word is very pure. Man said there are mistakes in the transmission of text from the NIV committee. God said the word of the Lord endureth forever. Man said the Bible is the words of men or a literary production. God said every word of God is pure. Man said, J.B. Phillips said, I felt bound to abandon thee. God dictated every word from cover to cover attitude. You know what he's saying? I really don't believe that God said all this stuff. The words of the Lord are pure words. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. That's what God said. Man said, every member of the panel was conscious that some of its decisions were in no sense certain. New English Bible Committee. God said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. All scriptures is given by inspiration of God. That's what God said. Man said God's, that the Bible is God's message and not his words. He believes the Bible is the wrong side of an embroidery. The picture is still there, but knotted, blurry, not, per, not beautiful, not perfect. He calls Christians amusingly uninformed who presume... The Holy Spirit dictated the actual words of the text to the original writers. He said, you silly, uneducated Christians, you just don't know better. I want you to see in this quote here the absolute contempt that these men have for the King James Bible. Notice this. This is from the NIV committee. Do not give them a loaf of bread covered with an inedible, impenetrable crust, fossilized by three and a half centuries. For any preacher or theologian who loves God's Word to allow that Word to go on being misunderstood because of the veneration of an archaic, not understood version of four centuries ago is inexcusable and almost unconscionable. They hate the King James... And what they're saying here is they hate the King James people. We're talking about church people. We're talking about pastors and preachers. Man, I tell you what, I believe in conspiracies. I think something's up. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Lucifer said in his heart, I will be like the Most High. And he said, I will sit in the midst of the congregation. I believe the devil wants to take over the church. I believe the devil wants to take over this church. One person at a time. Beware, Christians. Amen? Just, and by the way, just because we believe that this is the perfect Word of God, that does not exempt us from the battle that you and I face every day. Amen? I want you to notice this symbol here. It's on the back of a dollar bill. Here's another symbol here. The pyramid with...
top of it. That is the, um, the, the mark of the New World Order. You see it there on the back of a dollar bill. The eye of illumination there resting on top of that. That's referred to as the, as the, as the capstone. On the back of your dollar bill, it says, Anuit Coeptus Novus Ordus Seclorum, which means he favors, or he favors the undertaking or favors the birth of a new world order. We've heard that phrase before, right? And basically what we know, what we know for a fact as Bible prophecy students is going to happen is that there is going to be a changeover from the old order to a new order, basically a rule by Satan himself. That's what the new world order refers to and that's what that symbol refers to. And I want to show you this because you'll see it in the new Bibles. In, in the King James, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Notice how the NI, or the, excuse me, the New English Bible renders this verse. It says, The old order is gone, and a new order has begun. They're using the same, excuse me, they're using the same language. The King James says, that uh, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation, talking about Christ's coming, but notice the NIV calls it until the time of the new order. They're preparing people. There's even a what's called a New Age Bible. This is God's word for a new or newage, because it rhymes with sewage. Amen? Okay? A newage. Look at this. I'll just show you here some, some symbols about the eye and the capstone. That's the illumination, uh, the illuminated eye. That's Lucifer's eye, by the way. We see it here. Uh, the, notice the caption there at the bottom, Genius Awakened. Uh, you see this. If you start looking, you'll see it in a lot of places. That's the, uh, that's the I think, the Transamerica building in San Francisco. Uh, the eye and the capstone, the capstone. There it is, Forbes Magazine, the coming light years. Talking about illumination. Now I want you to notice this. In Isaiah 28, 16, in the King James, the Bible says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. This is referring to Jesus, right? And I want you to notice that in the King James, they're telling you that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation. Now where's the foundation in relation to a building? On the top or the bottom? It's on the bottom, isn't it? Okay? So when they say that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation, that's down here, right? Okay? Notice in Psalm 118, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner, the foundation stone down there on the bottom. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, this is the King James, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Again, on the foundation. Notice that the NIV calls him the capstone. They're saying that that symbol that you see represents Christ. It doesn't. It represents who? Antichrist. The one who's going to bring illumination into this world. Let's look at some more symbols. Symbols mean something. And by the way, let me say this, okay? When it comes to symbols, I'm going to say this. Stay away from them. You don't need them. Amen? God said, to be, God said don't make images. Amen? He said don't make images of, of anything in heaven, anything in this earth, anything beneath the earth. He said don't do that. He said, number one, you don't know what I look like to begin with. Amen? All those pictures we see of Jesus, I don't know that that's him. I don't think if I see Jesus walking down the street, I'm going to be able to recognize him by his picture. <laughs> Amen? You want to get an image of God? Here it is in black and white. That's the symbol. That's, that's what you need. Amen? So, I mean, stay away from all this other stuff. I mean, and I'm talking about the fish and all that stuff. So we don't need that junk. Amen? By the way, you, when you see a fish on somebody's bumper, see, you don't know if they're Christian or not. Amen? They probably stole that car, bought it, and left it on there. I mean, you can't trust them, can you? You look at a person's testimony, their life, they'll tell you whether or not they're saved. Amen? Oh, you know that stuff. Witches, the occultist, they all use secret symbols. Symbols are used to conceal certain knowledge from the masses. They use a symbol, and they have two meanings. One's a secret meaning, one's an outside meaning. And they tell you the outside meaning, but they don't tell you what the inside meaning is. Let's look at this symbol here called the triketra. Have you seen this symbol before on anything? Well, it used to be on the New King James Version of the Bible, and they've taken it off now. I don't know if they watch my video or not, but they've taken it off. 
you don't see it on there anymore, but on the first publishings of the new King James Bible, they put that symbol on there, and when I saw that, I said, you know, I want to know what that means. That just doesn't look right to me. I want to know what that symbol means. Let's look at the new king. By the way, you remember that statement I made about the wolves in sheep's clothing? Wolves in sheep's clothing are not sheep. Let me make another statement to you that's similar to that. The new King James Bible is not the King James Bible. Okay? Let me show you some things. They, they told everybody, well, we're just bringing, we're just taking out the these and thous, and that's all we did. That's not what they did. They took hell out 22 times. They omitted the blood 23 times. Repent 44 times. Heaven's taken out 50 times. You don't even have God's personal name, Jehovah, in the New King James Version of the Bible. They took it out. They replaced it. Okay? That's not the Word of God. That's not the Bible. Okay? That's not what it is. Let's look at this symbol real quickly here. Uh, from a New Age website, Triketra Journeys. Lorna Roberts says that this represents the power of three, used in witchcraft to represent the feminine deity. It is a vulgar symbol. I won't explain it. I have it explained on the video of the Da Vinci Code. Get that. Get that copy. Uh, uh, if anybody's watching this video, go to our website, www.kingjamescode.org, and uh, we'll get you a copy of the Da Vinci Code. And I explain in detail what that symbol represents. But it's a symbol for Isis worship, worshiping the goddess principle. And what's behind the goddess is mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I have this book. I'm going through this book. I'm reading this book called The Aquarian Conspiracy. Notice the symbol being used on there. And basically Marilyn Ferguson is writing how the new age is taking over the world and exactly how they're doing it. And she says they're using churches in order to do it. You see it on Ouija boards. Another Ouija board. Notice the symbols there of the Triketra and all these other occult symbols here. This one here is actually a copy of the Ouija board that's used on the TV show Charmed. Have you ever seen that show? Ever heard of it? It's about three witches. And they have that symbol on a book that they use called the Book of Shadows. Witchcraft. It's associated with witchcraft. What's it doing on a Bible? We'll find out. How many of you remember Led Zeppelin and Don't Lie? Stairway to heaven, right? Still have the album somewhere, maybe. Okay? I could teach for about 20 minutes on the stairway to heaven and what the words really mean and how they come right out of the occult. It's really weird. But you see, the, the, the lead singer of Led Zeppelin, I think it was Jimmy Page, who wrote Stairway to Heaven, claims that he wrote it in a trance. That something took over as he wrote those words. And he used this symbol because he was a student of Aleister Crowley. And I could talk all night about Aleister Crowley. But he was a student of Aleister Crowley and he used this symbol. And Aleister Crowley designed a set of tarot cards which are basically the occult version of the Bible. And they keep their secrets hidden in all these symbols. And I want you to notice that this hierophant which is the tarot card that he, that he used, the hierophant holds a wand in his hand and he has that symbol on the end of that wand. And I started looking at that and I'm going, what's up with that? And then I found a so-called Christian music group uses this symbol. Now I have a problem with this. Number one, because of the use of the symbol. Number two, because I know what Avalon is. Avalon, if you study the myths of King Arthur... And the round table, you know all that stuff? Avalon is a mythical island outside of Britain somewhere that is the connection between earth and the underworld. It is where the goddess witch lives, who is the real power behind King Arthur. That's what the name Avalon means. Why are they using this as a... I don't get it. Something's not right here. But I looked at three different versions of this tarot card called the Hierophant, and I found that symbol on all three of them. He's holding it in his hand, and that's very important. Because I found out that the Hierophant, that, that priest, that what it represents, the Hierophant teaches matters of faith, religion, belief, and morality. He is a wise teacher full of esoteric and occult knowledge. He aids in understanding the occult mysteries. He holds the keys 
to transformation. There's something about that symbol that is powerful in magic and witchcraft in the occult and transformation. He oversees the initiation of people into the mystery religions of ancient Babylon. According to famous, famed occultist Elise Bailey, channeling through a demon named Dwalkul, she says, there is no question that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance. She said, these mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of the church. She said, because Christ is the hierophant of the first and second initiations, he will administer the first initiation in the inner sanctuary of the church. Where did they say they were going to begin their work? In the church. Notice the symbol. Now, according to Thomas Nelson Publishers, who publishes the New King James, the Triketra is an ancient symbol for the Trinity. It comprises three woven arcs, distinct yet equal and inseparable, symbolizing the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct yet equal persons and indivisibly one God. Now remember, symbols always have two meanings, a secret meaning, the hidden meaning, and a meaning that they practically lie about. So if Thomas Nelson says that that triketra represents the Trinity, should we believe him? Especially when the Bible says that we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In other words, God says you should not have a symbol for the Trinity. Man says, here's a symbol for the Trinity. I think man's lying. Amen? I think man's lying. I think it's leading us to exactly what Paul warned us about in the Garden of Eden, let me get back to this here. Let me read this verse. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. He went after Eve. He went after the church. And when you go back to Genesis chapter 3, you'll see the very first words out of Lucifer's mouth are, Yea, hath God said casting doubt and actually denying the Word of God. Remember what he told her? He said, she said, God said, we'll die. And the devil said, ye shall not surely die. Contradicting in God's Word. This is what brought Eve to where she was. This is what brought us to a fallen state and we need redeemed of it. We don't need more of it. Amen? We need redeemed from it. I'm going to show you from the scriptures doctrinally. I'm not just going to give you my opinion, my research. I'm not going to give you what I think. I'm going to show you from the scriptures what you can righteously and truthfully believe about the Bible. Okay? Is it, is it okay for us to believe that there are mistakes in the Bible? I'm going to show you that it's not. I'm going to show you that you need to believe that there cannot be any mistakes in the Bible. Notice I'm going to teach you about Bible inspiration, Bible preservation, and Bible translation. Let's deal with inspiration first. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. That's teaching that God inspired or breathed into these men the very word of God. Notice Isaiah 51, 16. And I have put my words in thy mouth. When you read Isaiah, you're not reading Isaiah's opinions. You're not reading Isaiah's mythology. You're reading what God put in his mouth. And Isaiah wrote it down. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and took, touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. That is the doctrine of the inspiration of scriptures. Now, a doctrinal statement of any ministry will usually start out like this. We believe the scriptures to be the inspired, inerrant word of God in the original manuscripts. Now, I'll tell you that is what I believe. I believe that when Isaiah sat down with his, with his, with his pen and his ink and his uh, whatever it was he wrote on, I believe that what Isaiah wrote down there was the inspired, inerrant, without, without any mistake, Word of God. Do you believe that? Say amen. 
that when Isaiah read that to the people, when Jesus stood up and read that in the synagogue, it was the inspired, inerrant, without any error whatsoever, it was the Word of God. Can I hear you say amen? So I believe that when the Bible was first written in the original manuscripts, that it, it was inspired by God, it had no error in it whatsoever. But now let's go to the next part. Let's go to Bible preservation. Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The Bible is telling you that God had always intended that once he gave the word, he would preserve the word. Do you believe that? In fact, let me, let me put it down on a level that you can understand. Here's this idea that says that the Bible is not really been, that the Bible was in the original manuscripts, but it's not been preserved now. And yet, we're going to try to teach you that if you'll get saved, God will preserve you until the last day. If God cannot preserve and protect His Word throughout the centuries, how can He preserve and keep you in your life. It doesn't make sense, does it? The preservation of the Scripture. Notice the next verse. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus himself said, it's not going to go away until everything's done. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? My word shall not. Notice he says words, plural. That means all of them shall not pass away. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's, and, oh, what, look at this. All Scripture was given or is given? What's the difference? Past tense, present, continuing tense. Was given means that, yes, we believe that God inspired the original manuscripts, but He didn't preserve them. When the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration, that means that as you read this book, the Holy Ghost of God breathes His inspiration into you. you believe that? Say amen. How could you be saved if the inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit does not inspire this book as you read it? Present tense, look at that. So the faith statements of most ministries say, we believe the scriptures to be the in inspired, inerrant word of God in the original manuscripts. And they stop right there. What they don't tell you, and that sounds real spiritual, but what they don't tell you is, is that now that we've been to Bible college, we believe that there are mistakes that have, cr and corruption has crept in over the years to the Bible. That's what they believe. Now they tell you, oh yeah, we believe in the preservation of the scriptures. But they're contradicting themselves because they say, we believe the manuscripts got corrupted over the years and we can't be certain anymore what the Bible really says. That doesn't give me a lot of hope for tomorrow. I like laying my head down on my bed at night knowing that what God said is still true today. And I've got confidence in it. Every single word of it. Ministries all over the world believing that stuff. Here's how they apologize for it. Well-trained textual critics operating on the basis of sound methodology are able to rectify almost all misunderstandings that might result from manuscript error. Here again, that doesn't sound too promising to me. It would be like if I told you, now if you'll come and accept Jesus as your Savior, I can almost give you a guarantee that you'll spend eternity maybe in heaven. That doesn't sound too hopeful, does it? Here's what Isaiah said. The vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that has learned, saying, Read this, and I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. These guys don't have a clue where the Bible is. And I'm talking about the Bible professors, the Bible scholars, the theologians. They don't have a clue anymore. Original manuscripts. By the way, let me tell you this. There are no original manuscripts of the Bible anywhere. What are you talking about? The very, the very manuscript that Paul wrote out in his letter to, let's say, 1 Timothy, that, that, that piece of papyrus 
does not exist anymore. The very manuscript that Mark wrote his gospel on, the very one that he wrote with his own hand, does not exist anymore. The one that Moses wrote out doesn't exist anymore. We have copies, but we don't have original manuscripts. So when they say we believe the Bible was inspired only in the original manuscripts, what they're telling you is we believe in a Bible that doesn't exist anymore because it's gone away. And most of the originals were written on what's called papyrus. That's where we get the word paper from. You know what papyrus was made out of? Grass. Let me show you a verse in the Bible. The Bible says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You know what God's saying here? God said, I know that the papyruses will vanish away. I know that when you look at these 2,000-year-old uh, manuscripts, they're going to have holes in them, and there's gonna, the edges are going to be worn, and you won't be able to read all the letters. God said, I know that. But I promise you, I will always preserve my word on this earth. Isn't that amazing? Somebody say amen. Now let's deal with the doctrine of Bible translation. Now I know a lot of guys, I know a lot of guys, and if you're watching this video, I'm not against you because remember, I used to be on the other side of this thing. I know a lot of preachers who are still using the King James in their pulpit, and I want to say thank you for that. Thank you for sticking with it. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen. They may not, they, God may not have turned all the light on for you. God didn't do it for me for a long time. And I want to say this. I believe you stick with the King James. God will bless your church. God will bless your life. The power is not in us, preachers. The power is not in us. It's in the book. And I've had some very well-meaning preachers come to me and say, I, I, I use the King James. That's all I use. But I don't believe that a translation can be inspired the way the originals were. And you know what? That, they, they told me that, and I thought, you know, I'm not sure how to answer that. Until one day, God just kind of took me down a little journey in the Scriptures, and I'm going to show you from the Bible itself, not from my opinion, from the Bible itself, and I'm going to close with this. I'm going to show you from the Bible itself that God had every intention of not only inspiring the originals, not only preserving the originals, but also He had every intention on translating them so that you and I can understand. Notice what is being said up here. Some people say no translation is inspired, only original languages. No scriptural support for this statement. Let's look at what God said. Isaiah 28, 11, For with stammering lips, and what? Another tongue will I speak to this people. When Paul, when Paul used this verse to talk about the doctrine of unknown tongues, he said, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. In other words, God had always intended, even from the Old Testament, of speaking in a language other than Hebrew. Okay? In a language other than Hebrew. So in the New Testament, in the Old Testament it was written in Hebrew and in some parts Aramaic. In the New Testament we find it in a completely new language called Greek. It's the language of the Gentile world now. Not just the language of the Jews, the language of the Gentiles. But let's go a step further. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with what? Other tongues or other languages. Now, I know what we believe. We don't believe that they were going, Sha -na 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 -fa -la -ba -la -ba -la. we don't believe that, do we? We believe that they were speaking the language. In fact, there's 17 of them there in the book of Acts. You read every language that they were speaking, they were speaking there, and the men said, we're hearing them in our own language. They were understanding, and was what they were speaking inspired by God? Yes, because the Holy Spirit is the one that gave them the utterance. Are you with me? Look at this. How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Genesis, now I'm going to show you something from the King James. You're going to see the word interpret or interpretation in the King James. That word means translate. When if I go to a foreign country, and, I'm, and let's say I got called to uh, Mexico and I don't know Spanish, I'm going to, while I'm preaching, will those people be able to understand me? No, some of you don't understand me. Amen? If I'm down there and I'm preaching, they need to understand me. Who am I going to have standing by my side? An interpreter. 
Notice how this word is used in the King James. I'm going to go through these real fast, all right? And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter, a translator. Daniel chapter 5, verse 26. This is the interpretation or the translation of the thing. Daniel chapter 5, verse 7. Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation or the translation thereof. Matthew chapter 1. A virgin shall conceive, there shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted or translated, God with us. Mark chapter 5. He said, Talitha Kumi, which is being interpreted or translated, damsel. Uh, Mark chapter 15, they bring him to a place called Golgotha, which is being interpreted or translated uh, the place of a skull. Ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted or translated, my God, my God, why has... To? See, that was inspired, wasn't it? The translation was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus turned and saw them following and, and said unto them, Why seek ye, or what seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted or translated master. Uh, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted or translated the Christ. Uh, John chapter 1, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation or translation a stone. Said then to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation or translation sent. Now, interpretation of an unknown tongue is a gift of the Spirit. Look at what it says. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another what? The translation of languages is literally what that means. In other words, God said, I'm going to give gifts to men. I'm going to send down a gift called the translation of languages. Isn't that amazing? Can the Bible, can the English Bible be inspired by God? Yes. Look at this verse. Paul said, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he what? Translate. Translation is important. If the tongue, if an unknown tongue is given, it must be translated. And how is that to be done? Can a person in a church speak in an unknown tongue and then translate it himself? The answer is no. God forbid that to take place, didn't he? Can I share this with you without being mean? And I used to do this, and my wife used to get on me saying, cut that out, and I didn't believe her. Because I wanted people to think I was smart, because I went to Bible college and I learned some Greek letters. And I used to stand behind the pulpit, and I used to say, now the King James says this, now in the original Greek, and I used to read that, and I would then give a private translation of what I just read. Did you know that that is wrong according to the Bible? It's wrong. And really, what a lot of guys now are doing, they're not just trying to help you out with understanding the truths of God. They're trying to tell you that what you're seeing here, you can't believe and you can't trust. And you really, Jared, you won't know what the Bible says unless I tell you from the original secret languages that only I know. That's mystery religion, guys. That's mystery religion. If God said that he would give a gift to men called the translation of languages, and God ordained how that was to be done, watch this. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. Now I'm going to stop right here. Do you know how many original languages the Bible was written in? I just go, you should have been taking notes. Hebrew, that's one. Aramaic, that's two. And Greek, that's three. It's not four.